Hello and good morning uh, from Abidjan. Uh, welcome to the 11th AFCON Diary. Uh, it was another <laughs> crazy evening. It seems like we can't ever have a normal night in African football. Um, the reason why I'm recording this so late is that I actually took a bus with the other journalist and went to Bouake to watch uh, Cameroon versus the Gambia and then Algeria versus Mauritania. And I couldn't record a post-match podcast at the press center because everybody wanted to leave. Uh, the bus was going, so I had to I had to hop in, and obviously I couldn't record it in the bus. So I'm just getting around to it now. Um, so I watched both of those matches in Bouake. Bouake is, you know, for those that don't know, f- like a five-hour drive north of Abidjan. Um, it was a, a roads are great, beautiful scenery. Um, so I was really excited to head up there. I was disappointed I could only watch Algeria once during this AFCON, and that was this time. But at least I got to see them. So let's let's talk about that match first because, you know, that's the match that I think I watched the most, and um, it's the one I think most people are interested in. So if we talk about the last time that Algeria drew a match against Burkina Faso, they drew 2-2, right? And remember, the big takeaway from that match was that Algeria had a poor first half, right, or like a mediocre first half, and then they needed to make the substitutions. They needed to take off players like Riyad Mahrez. They needed to take off players like Sofiane Ferouli, players who are close to the coach but are older. We needed the fresh legs. Mohamed Amin Amoura was great when he came in, for example, the the 22-year-old, 23-year-old playing for Union Saint-Gilloise in Belgium. And so the discourse coming into this match, it was, is Jamal Belmadi going to be brave enough? Is he going to break from tradition and name a young side, name a side of players that aren't his friends really, like the older players are, but that we think, you know, are probably going to be the generation that can take Algeria forward. And he does. (laughs) Jamal Belmadi, not only like, benches Riyad Mahrez he swipes out like a whole bunch of players Yusuf Bilaili who has easily been the best Algerian player at this AFCON also goes on the bench which is a decision that I think most people uh, didn't necessarily agree with um, the entire midfield practic- yeah the entire midfield is subbed out and Amoura comes in as a as sort of second striker number 10 and you have two uh, two central midfielders so Rami Zerouki and Hisham Boudawi um, Rami bin Sabaini, the center half, uh, he was suspended for an accumulation of yellow cards and he's replaced by Mohamed Amin Tugay. So we have almost half the team is, is switched out. Um, that's something that, again, Algerian supporters were asking for. And as a result, you know, one hour prior to the match, when we got the team sheets, I think there was some optimism in the first half, I think we saw what we needed to in terms of players tracking back. Because you know, that's really been one of the main criticisms of Riyad Mahrez, for example, is that, yeah, he's not fit anymore. He can't run as much as he used to. Even technically, like sometimes he'll take a free kick and he'll take, you know, so he took a few very poor free kicks in this African Cup of Nations. But I think like one of the main uh, criticisms is the fact that he does lack match fitness. And as a result, He's not chasing back, for example, when we defend. You know, when when we don't have the ball, uh, you need to win the ball back, you know. And this time around, when we had Adam Munas on one wing and we had, um, was it Mohamed Amin Amour on the other wing? Munas on one wing, I think it was Amour on the other wing. Uh, we did chase back. We did chase back, yeah. We did chase back and we... Uh, I thought that was good. You know, it showed a lot of structure. It showed a lot of discipline. Um, we were still a little bit slow in possession. And that's been one of the main problems for Jamal Belmadi over the last two years is that, you know, you have um, too much horizontal passing. Uh, the time it takes to progress the ball up the pitch is absolutely criminal, I would say, at times. Um, not enough players play passes through the lines. Not enough players make runs. Um, that will, you know, move the defense. Um, Too many players want the ball at their feet 
and as a result, everything is too slow. But I did think we saw a little improvement in that sense. Um, still slow in possession, still struggling to break down defenses a little bit, but I thought we created a few decent chances. Um, Mauritania ended up scoring, though, before half, and they score from uh, a set piece. They score from a corner kick. It bounces around a little bit. Uh, there's a scramble, and, and they knock it in uh, off the post. Um Remember, this was one of the weaknesses that we had listed for Algeria prior to the tournament was we said the defensive midfield, we said uh, the center half, center back pairing, and then we said uh, defending set pieces. Even coming into this tournament, for example, Mozambique um, Mozambique scored against us on a set piece. We conceded two penalties, which technically count as set pieces as well. So this really was a, a big weakness for us throughout the tournament. So we're at halftime, it's 1-0, and as journalists, you know, we go to the cafeteria, and everybody's absolutely disgusted. Like They were saying, you know, even if we just draw this match, they are saying we, we'd, we'd rather lose than just draw this match, because unless they show, like, a real awakening and start, you know, scoring three or four goals and show that, you know, this first half was a fluke, even if we progress to the next round, we're probably going to get beaten anyway, so what's the point? Um, other journalists were saying, you know, Belmadi is going to be resigning, you know, tonight or tomorrow morning if we if we lose this match because him and the federation president Walid Sari don't have a great relationship at all. It's very cold, um, and so that was an interesting halftime break. Sort of, uh, we start the second half, and surprisingly to me, but I guess shouldn't be surprising to to other people. Riyad Mahrez is subbed in at half. And as a result, Adam Unas, who I think had a good first half on the right wing, is moved behind a striker and he subsequently disappears for the rest of the match. And Riyad Mahrez has another pretty forgettable 45 minutes for the rest of the match. So um, it started okay, I think, but Mauritania grew into the game as the second half progressed. Um, Amir Abdu, their coach, from actually from, he said he's from Marseille and he grew up with a lot of Algerians. Um, he explained how they prepared for Algeria. He said that we were expecting Nabil Ben Talib to start the match. And Nabil Ben Talib, when he starts, he's the deepest midfielder and he'll uh, initiate a lot of attacking sequences with these um, through balls behind the lines. So he was well, initially, Amir Abdu was saying that we were expecting him to start the match. And since we were expecting him to start the match, he was going to be the focal point for us. It was to deny Nabil bin Talib the, the, those entry point passes through the lines, as, as he can do. But Nabil bin Talib didn't start the match. And as a result, it said it took him like some time, him and his team, to, to realize that it was actually Isa Mondi now that was making the through the lines passes. And they had to deny him access. So that, that the whole game plan shifted and became when the center halves, the Algerian center halves have the ball, make sure they're denied uh, passes that you know break the lines into midfield or into the attack, and whenever Algeria makes a negative pass, meaning sideways or backwards, which again has been a big big problem for Jamal Belmadi, really over the last two years, we're gonna move our block forward, meaning we're gonna I increase and apply pressure defensively, and we do it do it and suffocate them a little bit, you know, and and we saw. That really bothered Algeria, especially towards the end of the match. And what Algeria ends up resorting to are these long balls. And you're playing long balls against a goalkeeper that's six foot four or six foot five. He's more than two meters tall, and some very very tall defenders as well. And uh, that was never going to really work for Algeria. So Algeria got frustrated as uh, you know as the second half progressed. Mauritania grew in strength and confidence. They could have added a second. They hit the the bar. Uh, Algeria had a few chances, like the, the Isa Mondi had a chance off of a set piece. But overall, it was the perfect match that encapsulates what's been wrong with this Algerian side over the last two years, is that there was, again, slow passing. You know, we're, we're not progressing the ball fast enough. Not enough sharpness in attack. Not enough movement in attack. Everybody wants the ball at their feet. Not enough confidence when you do have a chance in front of goal to put to be efficient, to be like a killer, you know, and to, to make sure that you get a chance, a half a chance and you score. And then in defense, um, you know, uh, not enough discipline and not enough uh, 
good defending as simply as that um so yeah and 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 the, to top it all off no accountability from the coaching or from the players you know they this was i think one of the more frustrating things and i'll touch up on it in a bit is that let me touch on it in a bit so anyways um let me just say a quick word about Mauritania, and then we'll talk about what this means for Algeria. Co- Mauritania coach Amir Abdu, like in 2021, loses his first two matches in the competition and then uh, wins the last match of the competition, and it's enough to get him through to the knockout stages. He's a really good coach. Um, he knew Mauritania. You know, his, you Go listen to the Mauritania preview, and you'll see that they were impressed with what he did with Nwadibu, who he was coaching club and a country. He was coaching Nwadibu and Comoros at the same time. And, uh, and he did a great job, obviously, and now he's doing a good job with Mauritania. So let's talk about Algeria, what this means for Algeria and Coach Jamal Belmadi. Because after the match, we go to the press conference, and um, the, immediately the very first question is from a colleague who... Me, personally, I think he's been treated unfairly by Jamal Belmadi throughout, really, his tenure. Um, he's a colleague that's, you know... He's not even necessarily critical or harsh. He just says things. And Jamal Bamadi from the very beginning thought that he has an agenda against him or he has an agenda against the national team. And I know that that's not the case because I know him. Um, but he asked a question. And I think the way he started the question was a little bit, you know, unnecessary. Um, coach, you're the only uh, Algerian coach. You said you make history. You're the only Algerian coach to ever be eliminated from two African Cup of Nations. <laughs> And consecutively, and another record that he didn't mention, but I'll throw out there is, you know, six matches in AFCON without a win. That's another record for Algeria. P- bad record to, to make, bad history to make. And the coach just refuses to answer his question, basically like, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you have an agenda. You've been on a mission from the very beginning. I know you have known you for six years now, blah, 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 blah. So immediately, again, lack of accountability, you know. I understand, like, the way he started the question wasn't, wasn't the nicest way, but if there's a problem when you, if you yourself can't say that you have a problem, then your players also think that we don't have a problem. And as a result, you don't improve, you know, and, and that's been a big, big problem for Belmadi is even, you know, the next question was what was missing, you know, for you guys. And he just said goals. You know, he's like, we have half chances and they don't go or sorry, we have so many chances and they don't go in and the opponent has half chances and we concede. And it's that thing where it's like, and he said, this is the mystery of football, like as if you're just you're the most unlucky, you're the unluckiest man in the world. You were unlucky in 2021. You were unlucky in 2022 when we failed to qualify for the for the World Cup. You're unlucky this year. No. (laughs) If the opponent has half chances and they're scoring, that there's a there's a reason for that. If you have ten million oppor- uh, opportunities to score and you're not scoring, there's a reason for that. And the fact that not only do you not know, but you're not looking to know or understand why these things are happening. For me, there's no greater indication that the coach needs to go and that we need a new coach than that. I think good thing for Algeria is that. Um, Jamal Belmadi is going. Uh, after the match, you know, the, the Algerian national team hotel is without a shadow of an exaggerate, like without a shadow of a doubt. I think it's, sorry, the, without exaggerating, the Algerian national team hotel is maybe 30 meters from the gates of the stadium. So all the supporters, they know that. And they all like staged the sit-in in front of the hotel. They didn't let the team bus, because they take a bus anyways, even though it's 30 meters. They didn't let the team bus back into the hotel. Uh, the FA president came and talked to supporters, and they were all yelling, Belmadi, quit, Belmadi, quit, Belmadi, quit. And the federation president was like, yeah, I understand. And the coach, apparently, he took that to heart. He wasn't, you know, he was quite emotional about the whole entire situation. And uh, and from what I know, from uh, a few different sources, uh, from what's been said amongst journalists that I trust, Jamal Belmadi will resign. So that's going to be the end of his tenure for the coach, you know, who um, did so well and then did so poorly at the same time. Um, It's really a a tenure of two halves, right? Because from 2018 to 2021, 
I mean, we're in dreamland. We win the African Cup of Nations, and we are on a 35-match unbeaten streak. And then AFCON comes around, eliminated in a group stage, eliminated from the World Cup. Slightly recover, you know, win uh, or are undefeated in another 13 matches on a trot, and then this time around, uh, <laughs> another elimination in the group stages. As he likes to point out, six matches lost in six years. But they tend to be the most crucial matches at the most crucial times. And that's not, you can't just say six matches in six years and think you're unlucky. No, there's a reason, like, those, you're losing the most crucial matches. So that's my biggest problem with Jamal Abdel Mahdi is, is that he doesn't seem to be able to either, maybe he does it personally, internally, but you have to take public accountability as the coach of the national team, you know? You can't just do it privately and internally and say, yeah, it, internally we're looking for what went wrong and we're going to fix it. No, you have to do it publicly as the coach of the national team. So Jamal Bamadi is gone. And, and uh, uh, what's been his, I, mean, I spoke about like, you know, some of the on the pitch, what's been wrong and, and the fact that he doesn't take accountability. And I'll just say one final thing about the most disappointing part of Jamal Bamadi's reign for me is that when he came to the national team, and I mentioned this in a previous AFCON diary, he had said that um, some players believe the national team belongs to them. Nobody, nothing is a given anymore. Nobody owns the national team. We're going to reset everything to zero. Nobody's a star. And he, he discarded a few different stars. There's another anecdote that I forgot when I talked about that the last AFCON diary. At the 2019 AFCON when Algeria won, Riyad Mahrez in the training camp before the tournament started, the star, the captain of the national team, uh, he's late for training. Just a few minutes, not even like, and the, everybody's on the bus. They're waiting for Mahrez. He's on his way down from his hotel room. And Bel Mahdi says to the driver of the bus, go. And everybody's like, wait, coach, Mahrez is still here. And Bel Mahdi says, go. They go to the stadium. Mahrez takes an Uber to the stadium, or there's another car that takes him to the stadium. And he um, he's sitting there watching, training. He's not allowed to train with the team. And there's a, a friendly match the following day, and he doesn't play in the friendly match as well. Holding your best player accountable. That's something that I feel like, at least we get the impression that that's gone now. You know, um, That this is a coach and a group of players that made the national team their own. Um, and anybody else, sometimes fellow teammates, journalists, that challenge that, that challenge them, were seen as, you know, like agitators. And eventually it creates such an unhealthy atmosphere, not only because you think the entire world is against you, but more importantly, because you think the entire world is against you and because you think people are irrationally criticizing you, Again, you're not, there's no self-accountability. You're not questioning yourself. And ultimately, I think that's the coach's biggest downfall. So uh, I talked a lot about Algeria, almost 20 minutes already. So I'm just going to go touch on quickly on the, the Cameroon, versus, Cameroon versus the Gambia because that was an, a really, really good match too. <laughs> Crazy match. Um, first of all, what people don't know, I think, is that Cameroon and Cote d'Ivoire have a huge, huge rivalry. Uh, it's a friendly rivalry. They call each other the in-laws, apparently because Samuel Eto'o married an Ivorian uh, and he's Cameroon. And I think there's a few different artists that, you know, uh, married from the other nationality. And so they call each other the in-laws and there's a friendly rivalry. But on the pitch, whenever Cameroon play, they get booed. <laughs> they get booed pretty heavily. And it was the same thing in 2021 in Cameroon when the Ivory Coast played. I remember seeing the Ivory Coast play against Sierra Leone in Equatorial Guinea and they were cheering against them as well, or booing against them as well. So uh, that's one thing that you have to know. And so the the atmosphere was great because everybody was supporting the Gambia, and they had this one. Um, as as you know, the Gambia was applying pressure on Cameroon. They have this one chant that they do here in um, in Cote d'Ivoire. They go, Ah, ils ont chaud. Ah, ils ont chaud, which means like ah. Like, they're sweating, like, they're hot. <laughs> like, like, pressure's getting to them. So, uh, so yeah, it was really, really cool to see, like, the the crowd get behind um, the Gambia. But a few notes uh, prior to, to actual gameplay. Andre Onana's benched. 
Fabrice Andoa, his cousin, the second goalkeeper, uh, starts for Cameroon. I thought he had a good match overall. Solid. Didn't let in any crazy goals or anything like that. Um, just a quick note on that. I mean, Andre Onana. You leave Manchester United late. Nobody's happy with you over here. You play. You don't. You have three shots on target. You concede three goals against Senegal. And now you're on the bench again. It's like, I don't know. Sometimes I think, like, was it all worth it? It reminds me of the Mohamed Salah episode that I talked about yesterday when, you know, everybody has interests. You know, uh, Cameroon has interests. Manchester United has interests. And everybody's trying to make everyone happy. And as a result, you make nobody happy, you know. Anyways, uh, Cameroon play a 3-4-3. I actually think this was the first time that Rigo Song put all of his best players in the best positions. Uh, the problem is you're experimenting with a new system in the middle of a competition in a must-win match, you know. But I do like this 3-4-3 in terms of getting your best players on the pitch all in the right positions. Um, there's one problem with the 3-4-3 is that the space between the wing backs and the, the right center back or the left center back, you know, that space can be exploited. And the problem when you play against a team like the Gambia is that their best players explore those spaces players like Abli Jalo players like Musa Baro players like Yakuba Minte and so uh, you know it was a tight first half that could have went either way but I think at half the Gambia were the happier of, of either side uh, Cameroon took control at the beginning of the second half in my opinion um, and I was really starting to think that Sun got this right and Carl Toko Akambi scores and again how do Cameroon score they score through crosses or set pieces again uh, Gambia slowly cl claw their way back in after 20 minutes of the second half. And then for 10 minutes, they have Cameroon on the hope, on the ropes. You're in a situation where um, the Gambia score, and if the score remains 1-1, both are eliminated. But whoever scores next goes through, and what happens next is absolutely mad. Um, Ibrima Koli from the Gambia scores in the 85th minute. And this is where a little bit of experience and a little bit of coaching, I think, needs to needs to come through because Ibrima Koli and the Gambians, they go absolutely mental. And I can understand, like, you're, you're beating Cameroon, you're probably on to the next round. They start running, they celebrate with the Gambian fans over here, and then they run all the way around the athletic pitch, all the way to the other side over here where there's more Gambian fans. And they're like, you know, shirts are off and screaming, yeah, yeah, they're sprinting, like... And there's still like five minutes left to play in regulation time, not including injury time. And sure enough, in this AFCON, we've made this observation like time and time again. How many times have we seen one team score and then the opposing team respond? And then sometimes with two goals. And that's exactly what happened here. So Cameroon equalized two minutes later, and then they take the lead through another set piece, a corner kick. Uh, the, the, I think the, the equalizer was through a cross. That was an own goal. And then the the lead was through a corner kick. So Cameroon have only scored crosses or set pieces uh, in this tournament. That's something to keep in mind for Nigeria, their next opponents in the round of 16. Prepare for crosses or set pieces because that's probably how Cameroon are going to score. Um, the Gambia scored another goal in the 97th minute, but it was re refused due to VAR. But, I mean, it was obvious. The guy tried to do a Diego Maradona, tried to punch the ball into the goal. I didn't see it initially, but... Um, you can't do that in the VAR era because it's going to get caught. Um, you could see it like the, the toll that, you know, this match took on the Cameroonian players at full time because they, five of them collapsed. Um, like all over. The, you saw Samuel Eto'o cry real tears after the match as well. You can see that on social media. Rigo Bersang, it was good to see him hand in hand with Andre Frank Zambo and Gisa walking around the pitch. I think this win did a lot of good for the indom indomitable lines. And now when you're in the knockout stages, like me, I told you, I had no faith in this team because Rigo Bersan was the coach, as harsh as that sounds. But when you're in the knockout stages, when you have the football heritage that Cameroon does, anything's possible now, you know. Um, it's up to them to defend better than they defended and continue continue threatening through crosses and set pieces as they as they surely will do. But I'm just going to be curious to see if they continue with that 3-4-3 because I do think uh, I think it could work against Nigeria. Because, uh, it depends who Nigeria plays. If they play like 
a 4-4-2. I think it could work if you get your fullbacks to play back a little bit. But, you know, if they start playing Moses Simon and they get those wide players in threatening positions, I'm not sure, actually. It's going to be an interesting thing to keep an eye on for Cameroon uh, versus Nigeria in the round of 16. Anyways, other than that, uh, Senegal won against Guinea, I believe. Yeah, 2-0. So Senegal are through with nine points. Um, I believe uh, Guinea are also through, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then you had... The Gambia, uh, sorry, Cameroon through as well. And then in Algeria's group, you have Mauritania, Angola, and Burkina Faso through. So you have three teams from both Group C and D. That's it. Another probably crazy day is coming tomorrow with uh, Group E and F. I think um, the host Cote d'Ivoire still have to find out if they can qualify or not. I've already been going for 26 minutes, which is far, far too long. And it's 5 o'clock in the morning over here. So I need to upload this and get to sleep. Take care, everybody, and I'll speak to you tomorrow if I don't collapse of absolute exhaustion.